Well, praise the Lord that I can uh, be here to share with you God's Word. We have a word of prayer first, shall we? Father, may you speak to our hearts and let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you. Cleanse once again our hearts from all our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, there was a story that was told of a pastor. He was uh, going to his study on uh, Christmas Day itself. And as he was preparing his study, as he looked through his message, he fell asleep. And he had a dream that Jesus never came to this world. And what happened was in the dream, he saw no Christmas decoration, no Christmas tree, nothing about Christmas at all. He went out from his church into the streets and he saw no celebration at all, no uh, carols, nothing of that sort. He came into his own study and he found that there's nothing to do, nothing at all that has to do with Christmas. Books that he have, well, he looked into the books, found that nothing at all about the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. And then suddenly somebody uh, knocked at his door and says, can you come because somebody is sick? Uh, we need you to come and uh, minister to this person who is dying. So he's, he went to the house of this uh, woman who was uh, dying and he says, I have something to share with you. I've got a word to encourage your heart. But he, as he opened the Bible to look for a familiar uh, promise, it ended with Malachi. And there isn't any New Testament at all. Two days later, the woman passed off. And he stood at a gravesite. And when he opened the Bible again, of course, <laughs> there's no New Testament to encourage her. I encourage the people around. There was no hope at all to speak about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of all of us who are in Christ today. And then all of a sudden he woke up because he heard the singing of his, his uh, church choir. And thank God, he says, it's only a dream. Thank God that the Lord Jesus did come. Well, if the Lord Jesus didn't come at all, then it'll be a, a, a tragedy for all of us, isn't it? That our sins are not forgiven and we are still in our sin and we will die without our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, Christmas really begins in the Old Testament as I want to bring you into the book of Isaiah chapter 9 from verses 1 through to 7. It really begins in the Old Testament with the promise of the coming of the Messiah and it fills the pages of the Hebrew Bible which we call uh, the Old Testament today. And the Jews, unfortunately, even until today, they are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And that's very unfortunate for them because they refused to accept the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ as their Messiah also. One day, many years ago, I went to a synagogue here in Singapore. And having been into the synagogue with my church members because we just want to visit the synagogue, uh, one of these Jewish guys, a Singaporean, is supposed to lead us around and he says, you are from the church, isn't it? You are, from, you are a pastor. I say, yeah, I'm the pastor. He says, and he was very frank with me. He went straight to the point and says, you know, your Jesus is a very wicked man, you know. He's, he's a murderer, he's a thief, and so on and so forth. I don't think he would have said that today, isn't it? Because he would be in trouble. But that's their perception of the Lord Jesus Christ until today. But as we celebrate an Old Testament Christmas, we do so first of all, right? As we look at the promise that the Lord has given to us, or at least what we can see from the scripture. And there we have in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7, this reading from the King James Version that, so, that says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Yes, there's the volume of books 
And what volume of books is he talking about? It is in the Old Testament. And there we see in the account in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, that unto us a child is born, and so forth. And then when you look at verse 7, verse 7 says that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Yes, it will come to pass. Now, in order for us to see the connection of this child who will be born as seen in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through to 7, Isaiah, the prophet, saw all these things. He knew the coming of the Messiah. That's a glorious event that Isaiah saw. He saw there is hope. There is a great light that will come and be shone into the lives of many, specifically as we look into the account of the Old Testament in the land of Israel, right? We see the northern part of Israel, the northern part of Israel have to do with the two tribes of Israel. It is what we call Zebulun and Naphtali. I will just show you the map down here, Zebulun and Naphtali. You see the divided kingdom? In the days of uh, uh, Isaiah, it was a divided kingdom. Now we are going to go through a bit of geography, a bit of history, and there we see the geographical site of uh, the land of Israel in, in, the, in the old days there. And we see the land of Zebulun. I don't know whether you can see the land of Zebulun, and that would be in the uh, northern part of Israel, just beside the Sea of Galilee, right? And then we will see also uh, Naphtali in, uh, down there. There you have Zebulun, and there you have Naphtali also just beside the Sea of Galilee on the left. That's the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, Israel in the days of Isaiah was a divided kingdom. And the prophet Isaiah saw the sun that would be born to remove that darkness and enlighten the world. There's hope that God will give to the children of Israel, specifically the Northern Kingdom, uh, when Jesus comes later on, as we see in the New Testament. Now, the most weighty words that we will find in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7 is this word that I have mentioned earlier, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it, all right, or will do this. And there we see Isaiah is saying this, Isaiah is saying that God's intent to accomplish this coming of the Messiah will be with zeal. It will come to pass, all right? And when will it come to pass? 700 years later. I'll mention about it later on also. 700 years later, in the New Testament time, we will see the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. That was the appropriate time in which God sent forth His Son. He didn't come in the days of the Old Testament part of the Old Testament period. He came in the New Testament period. It was in a period when there was the, the, the Romans who, who did a tremendous work in transportation, the road systems and so forth. And in the fullness of time, in the right time, Jesus came into this world. And there was this uh, access to all different parts of Israel, all different parts of the world. And that was the time when the Savior Jesus came. God's way of doing things. This is his plan. All right. And therefore, we don't despise the promises of God. He says from the scriptures and it will come to pass. All right. Let me just go into a very brief background to the book of Isaiah. Just a very brief background to Isaiah chapter 9, all right? And there we see in Isaiah chapter 9, the time frame of the invasion. I want you to see the Assyrians coming to invade. They have gone to many parts of the, that part of the world, and they were coming also to the northern part of Israel. And that would be, uh, you know, from, from Jerusalem or Samaria on, onwards, 
upwards there, and that would be Israel itself. The Bible tells us they were coming to Israel, Northern Kingdom, and they were also coming down south towards Judah itself. I'll show you down here in this verse. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 4, we see the wrath of the Assyrians. They will come forth and they will be able to take the wealth of Damascus and they will also be able to take the spoils of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom and they will do those things, all right? The Assyrians were fast and they were very swift in their invasion and they were very cruel also. And I want you also to see down here in verses 7 and 8 of Isaiah chapter 8 here. There we are told that they will finally come into Judah. You look at uh, chapter 8 and verse 8. I highlight Judah and they will come to Judah. And the thing is this, I read in verse 8, and it will sweep on into Judah and it will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, all right? And its outspread wing will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. That's where the Emmanuel will come, isn't it? In Judah. And what happened was that when the invasion came, they actually didn't really completely control or invade uh, Judah. They come, they did destroy quite a number of things in Judah, but there we want to take note that God has his hands to protect uh, Judah. And then we see in verse 21 and 22 that there was the distress, there was the gloom, you know, in the days of Israel and Judah. And the people were very troubled, right? As you think of the war today in Israel, between Israel and Hamas, oh, that's distress, very distressing, isn't it? Uh, people are in trouble, houses have been destroyed, properties have been destroyed, and so forth. Distress and gloom, all right? And the Bible tells us, verses 21 and 22, this is what Israel and Judah uh, would have gone through in those days. Just to let us all know that God has allowed trouble to come to Israel and Judah, and that was for a purpose. They were a disobedient people and God had to punish them, teach them a lesson. Sometimes it is not because of sin, but it is because God just allowed things to come to test our lives, to make sure that we are walking with Him so that we can be faithful to Him. This is where we see from the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 says, These things happen to them as an example. And when you study the Old Testament, you just take note that these are examples for us. Note the examples for us applied in our lives in the New Testament time, all right? And don't say, I don't want the Old Testament because Old Testament is out of date. It's not out of date. It's, a, it's part and part, a parcel of the Word of God, isn't it? It's a portion of the Word of God. And we cannot say, I'm a New Testament Christian, I'm not an Old Testament Christian, <laughs> you know. And there are Christians who say things like that. We are uh, uh, the, a Christian of the Bible, right? It's Old or New Testament. We are able to read both uh, Old and New Testament. And so the Bible tells us down here, this thing happens as an example for all of us. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. This is all for our benefit, our edification. The Word of God is for us. So, beloved, this morning down here, take note that when you look into the account of trouble that came into the, uh, the land of Israel, specifically the Northern Kingdom, all right, and of, of course, Southern Kingdom affected a bit. Take note that when trouble comes your way, don't uh, abandon God, all right? Don't curse God. I know there are some people who are not happy when trouble comes their way. They want everything to be smooth in their life as a Christian. You know, come to believe in Jesus and there's no trouble in your life. No, that's not, not right at all, isn't it? Come to believe in Jesus, there'll be problem in your life. You're going to get sick, you'll die also, isn't it? If you come and believe in Jesus Christ. But the thing is this, we have salvation in Christ, our hope in the Lord, 
and one day we'll be in heaven. But there'll be trouble that will come into our lives. It'll affect us in our lives today. Learn the lessons, and the Bible tells us these things happen for our example and for our instruction also. So let's dive into the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 9 now, all right? I'm going to bring us to the hope of the coming light in verses 1 to 5 of the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah was commenting about the northern kingdom, Israel, recently been captured by the Assyrians, and then the threat coming down to the southern part of uh, the land of, we would call it Israel today, all right? And that would be Judah. I want you to see down here in the book of 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 29. 2 Kings chapter 15 verse 29 here tells us that Assyria took the northern kingdom. And I highlighted these places that the Assyrians came to take. And I just want to highlight to you one particular place called Hatzo. You know, I, I was in Israel. We did a study tour in Israel with Jerusalem University College. And thank God the instructor brought us to Hatzo. Hatzo is in the northern part of Israel. And Hatzo was a fortress. And the amazing thing is this, Hatzo fell to the Assyrians. If Hatzo fell to the Assyrians, then Israel, would be in great trouble, right? It's just like, it's just like, you know, when the Japanese come into Singapore, if Malaya fall, Singapore is going to be in trouble. And Malaya fell. Hadzo fell. And when Hadzo fell, then Israel will be in trouble. And Israel was in trouble. And it's the same with Judah also, all right? So Hadzo was a, was a fortress, and Assyria took the northern kingdom, Samaria, as the capital also. Take a look down here at the uh, map, and there you have the Assyrian Empire coming down, and there you have in the northern part, there are some places that you want to take note of, and those were the places the Assyrians conquered. But notice in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2, the announcement of change, right? There will be no more gloom for the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. There will be no more change. Why? Because Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah will first appear in these places. Let me show you down here in, uh, before I go to verse 3. Let me, let me go back again, right? In verses 1 to 2, in the former time, invasion will come in verse 1. In verse 2, people in darkness have seen a great light. That is hope, all right? That is hope. Who will be this light? And when will the light come to give them hope at all? All right? And then we see, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 3, Isaiah says the Messiah will come and bring joy and prosperity to the people. Hope, and that is important, all right? I don't know whether you watch the, the video in YouTube of the, uh, the, the release of the hostages, and I saw them. I saw it in YouTube of the Israelis who were released from Hamas, uh, imprisonment or, you know, taken as hostages. And I saw this young boy with the specs on. He's nine years old only. And BBC took a shot of him in an Israeli hospital. And he was led by an Israeli uh, nurse, a military nurse, and brought out in the entrance of the hospital. And then he saw his dad far away. And he ran towards his father. Oh, that was a tremendous picture of hope. Being released and having seen your loved ones again. Hope. Hope in the midst of trouble. Right? And that's where you see Isaiah says the Messiah will come. 
The Messiah will bring, give you joy and prosperity. The prophet didn't know when this will be, when the deliverance will come. But I tell you, it is 700 years later. But even though it is 700 years later, there is still hope for the children of Israel. All right. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 4 to 5, the prophet saw the cessation of war. He foresaw the time when the Lord will break the oppression of the enemies. He saw it as he looked at it. He remembered Midian through Gideon, if you remember, and by the power of God delivered Israel from persecution and oppression. In verse 5, war will end. The context of the Syrian invasion will end. The enemy will be defeated and there is not going to be any more war, all right? But for now, we will have to cite, we will have to go back to this matter of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 2. And we got to answer this question. <coughs> Who is the light that would come? And I'm going to bring you into the book of Matthew chapter 4, very briefly in Matthew chapter 4 to help us understand and to be reminded again of the light that will come. I want to encourage all of us this morning that if we are in trouble today, there is hope for all of us. There is a light. There is a war that happens. Yes, as we look into the, 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 the people in the days of the Old Testament, Naphtali and also in Zebulun, and the northern kingdom having trouble and so forth. But there is hope. And when you come to the New Testament time, you will see the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah predicted no war. The war will cease. Yes, the war did cease. But when you come to the New Testament time, it is a different thing altogether. When Jesus came into this world to give hope to all of mankind, that is why we celebrate the occasion of Christmas. We remember Christmas. We remember the occasion of the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ and then of his death on Calvary's cross and his resurrection and his soon coming. The source of the comforting word is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew chapter 4 is the account that is mentioned here from verses 12 down to 17. Jesus begins his ministry down here and we can see the account that is mentioned here. Now remember the biblical account of where Jesus was born. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us he was born in Bethlehem and then later on he went to Egypt because there was persecution by Herod and then later on he went to Nazareth. Nazareth is up there in the northern part of Israel. Nazareth is what we call in the Old Testament part of the land of Zebulun. All right, let me give you the map again down here. This is the picture of the map, right? But there is no Old Testament words that is mentioned here. You can see the word Galilee there. That's part of the uh, place of Naphtali and Zebulun. All right, both quite a big place down there. And that is just beside the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus went to this part of where we know the Bible mentions that it was a fulfillment of the Word of God. I want you to see as I go back again to the book of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13. Look at Matthew 4 and verse 13. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Right? And go back down here, that's where he went, right? Can you see Nazareth down there? In the map, you can see Nazareth down there. That's the whole area, Naphtali and Zebulun area, that he went to live down there. And this was the fulfillment of what we see in scriptures of the prophet Isaiah saying it. Go back again. So in verse 14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the, of the Gentile. 
And Matthew tells us that the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region, the shadow of death, and on them a light has dawned. What light is he speaking about? He's not speaking about the Old Testament. Uh, there is the understanding that Northern Kingdom has been delivered. But in the context of the New Testament, Jesus tells us, uh, the scriptures tells us that Jesus came and gave hope to the children of Israel, specifically in this place called Galilee of the Gentiles itself. All right. Now, I want you to see the reason why Jesus came from Nazareth to this place in Capernaum. Go into the map again down here. When he was in Nazareth, he went up later on to live in Capernaum. If you study the life of Christ, you will know that he went and he lived in Capernaum. Because Capernaum was a very significant site there. Go and visit Capernaum when you are in Israel, all right? And you will see it is just beside the Sea of Galilee. A lot of trading going on in those days. And Capernaum is quite near to the King's Highway. And there will be a lot of people moving up and down. When Jesus was in Nazareth, there were only a few people living in Nazareth. I want you to see down here in John chapter 1 and verse 45. Bible tells us Nathaniel said these words. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Giving us the understanding that Nazareth is insignificant. When Jesus was there in Nazareth, as he was growing up in Nazareth, that city has only a very few small population. Some commentators say the city has only about 400 in population only. And so Jesus has his plan. And that was the fulfillment of what the Bible tells us that, you know, he moved from Bethlehem, from this place, Nazareth, and then he moved on to Capernaum. And when he was in Capernaum, he was able to do so much more. He was able to preach the word of God, and he was able to tell people uh, the truth concerning God, the Almighty, salvation, and so forth. Now, I want you to go back and see in verse 17 again. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? And so he went. He was in Capernaum, and he preaches in these three areas. You see Capernaum, you see Chorism, you see also uh, Bethsaida. These three areas, sometimes it's called the Evangelical Triangle. The Evangelical Triangle. All right? And there, he preaches the word of God to these people. Beloved, I want you to see that Jesus has his ministry. He went to places where there were people and he went to places where people have not heard the word before. He went to the places where there is a need for the gospel to be presented and to give them the hope of eternal life. Many years ago, I was standing on the railway in one of the railway stations in Lucknow, in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, in India. And I was part of the OM team, Operation Mobilization, and we were giving out gospel tracts. And we stood in a railway station to give out gospel tracts. You know, there's so many people in India, so many people in Lucknow. That's the capital of Uttar Pradesh, giving out thousands thousands of gospel tracts and when I saw a young man standing quite a distance away he had on his hand uh, in his hand a, a can of coca-cola quite well dressed I went up to him and said you speak English uh, he said yeah little uh, so I tried to communicate with him but it's a bit difficult to communicate. He doesn't understand fully in English. But I just gave him a gospel track. Took a gospel track. He read it there and then. Read it. And in his broken English, he spoke to me. He said, Who is this man? Jesus. Who is this man? Jesus. Can you imagine? First time in his life, he read about the name of Jesus. He'd never heard of the name of Jesus, never read the name of Jesus ever in his life. 
first time he read the name of Jesus. I tell you, it was such a fantastic feeling for me to be able to give a gospel tract to a person who have never known about Jesus in his life. But what was in his hand? It was a Coca-Cola can. Coca-Cola went there, you know, and people know about Coca-Cola. But Jesus Christ, they have never heard. They have never heard of him. You know, we talk about this matter of Christ going into Galilee of the Gentiles. It is true. If you look around in Singapore also, foreigners are coming into Singapore. And that's our opportunity to reach out to them. Many of them may not have heard about Jesus Christ. They have heard about Singapore. They have heard about many things. But what about Jesus Christ? They may not have heard about him at all in their lives. This is your opportunity. Christmas is our opportunity to be able to go forth and to herald forth that good news. And I'm trying to tell you down here, beloved, as you look into this account of the uh, Christmas in Old Testament, you will be able to see how God, in His grace and mercy, saved the land of Israel, the land of Judah, giving them hope, the war ceased. In the New Testament, Jesus came and the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah is that Zebulun and Natalie will see light. They will have hope. There are many people in the world today who don't have hope. If you think about this matter of Christmas, we are very privileged people to celebrate Christmas and to have that wonderful occasion of Christmas. While many in the world today don't understand what Christmas is all about. So would you take opportunity during the occasion of Christmas to go forth, tell your loved ones, your friends. And some people have heard about Christmas many times. Never mind. Just give them the word of God again and again. All right. Let me just bring you now finally to this part of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7 down here. And Isaiah and his prophecy gives us a glimpse into the wonderful light in Jesus Christ. This is a description of the Messiah himself. And how wonderful it is to be able to see who this Messiah is. Just a reminder to all of us this morning of who this Messiah is to us in our relationship. He is the wonderful counselor. Some people split the two, the word, two words. Huh? Some people say he is wonderful and he is also a counselor. But some put them together. He is a wonderful counselor. Yes, he is a wonderful counselor to us. Right, And he is the one who can help us in all troubles in our lives today. And there you have the word that I put there in the book of Judges 13 and verse 8. Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Right? His name is wonderful. His name is above all names, isn't it? He is wonderful. And then in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 29, and there we have here, he is the wonderful in Counsel and excellent in wisdom. Wonderful counselor. All right. We, if we have that opportunity, go and be a wonderful counselor to people who have need today. But Jesus is our great counselor. If you have problems today, go to him first. Ask him for help and seek the scriptures. He'll give you wisdom and help you to overcome your problems. Not that he will completely solve your problems quickly in that sense, but you have to go to him. He is the wonderful counselor. If not, go and seek uh, counseling from your church leaders, your pastor and so forth. Go and seek uh, counseling from them. I've done counseling before and counseling is not easy, all right? We fall short in our counseling effort with people. No matter how qualified you are as a counselor, we fall short in our counseling also. And you know, one day I was counseling a, a church member, <coughs> that's some time ago. And I was speaking to her and uh, counseling her. And then after that, I said, let us pray. Uh, and as I was praying, I fell asleep, you know. 
I just for a few seconds, I fell asleep. And then I woke up and I continued to pray. And after that, after the amen, I opened my eyes and I looked at her and she looked at me in such a weird look, you know. Because when that, that period of time when I doze off, uh, I don't know what words I use. You see the, the, the set, the, the, I mean, the, <laughs> we, we counselors are not uh, sufficient in, in really counseling uh, people to, to the full extent. And, and saying that, you know, this is the, uh, this is the way in which we go and, uh, you know, we don't have our shortcomings. We have our shortcomings. But uh, like I said, beloved, let's go to the Lord and let Him help us in counseling us. He's the wonderful counselor. I want you also to take note that He is the mighty God, isn't He? He's a great and mighty God. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke in Grace Church on the matter of occults in the Old Testament, because I centered more, I, I, I uh, you know, uh, preached more on the Old Testament, and I spoke about occults in the Old Testament. And when I covered this matter of the occult in the Old Testament, I remember the, that the song that we used to sing with our, our kids. I remember my children when they were younger in age, and I think maybe you remember this particular song that we used to tell our children or we used to sing with our children. We see the television and the television will be having this song that will be sung. And the song says something strange in the neighborhood. Who do you call? What's the answer? Ghostbuster. Ghostbuster. <laughs> Isn't it? But the thing is this, we don't need to call Ghostbuster. We'll have to call the Almighty God. Isn't it? Because He's the one who can help us. Go to Him. He is the great and almighty God. He is the everlasting Father. Speaks of a relationship with Him. He is the one who will be the uh, Prince of Peace, who will give us peace in our lives. There is no other way in which you can find peace in your life except through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that relationship. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 tells us that there is that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, there will always be the struggle in your life and there will always be the, the, you know, you are unsure about many things, you know, especially when you are having the problem of uh, leaving this world. And we have people who are not sure about it and they're very troubled about it. We must have that relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. One day I went to the hospital and I spoke to a member of my church, a fellow who was, he was actually dying. He says, Pastor, I'm, I'm afraid. And I asked him, you have a relationship with Jesus? He says, yes. I have Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. And I read to him John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again to take you to myself. Oh, I tell you, he was full of joy. He was filled with peace in his, in his expression. And I went off that hospital with joy in my heart to know this guy is at peace. He passed off later on. I conducted his funeral. God can give us that peace. Do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ? If you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, then we know the Prince of Peace will be there in your life always. And then in verse 7, we will see down here that an Old Testament Christmas gives us this word, Hope, all right? The Lord of hosts will do it. From gloom to darkness, and glo from gloom and darkness to hope that we will have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. The people that walk in darkness and gloom will see a great light. But you know, the hope would come 700 years later. And that's a long time. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? of Bethany in Israel, 
when the brother uh, Lazarus was ill, she, the two sisters, asked a messenger to send a message to Jesus. And where was Jesus? He was in Bethany beyond the Jordan. All right, there are two Bethanies. Huh? One in Israel, the other one is Bethany beyond the Jordan. It's in the Jordanian side. And news went to Jesus. Your beloved friend, Lazarus, is sick. Come fast. But he took four days for him to come to see Lazarus. And when he came four days later, Mary and Martha were disappointed, you know. You can read the words in the scriptures. Lord, if you had come, he would not have died. Mary said that. Martha said the same thing. Lord, if you had come earlier, he would not have died. What is this about? You mean God is your servant? You mean God is the one that if I call, he must answer? If he doesn't answer, I'm disappointed with him. Who is God to us? Servant or Lord or King? I end with this story. There was a, a story that was told, this is only a story, eh, of a man who was chased by a lion. And a lion, of course, was running very fast, isn't he? Fast and furious, <laughs> running after him. And as he was running away from the lion, he looked back, he says, oh, the lion is coming towards me very fast. And he prayed to the Lord. He's a Christian man, and he prayed to the Lord. He says, Lord, please be merciful and gracious to me. Please, I pray, make the lion a Christian lion. <laughs> Then what happened is that as he continued to run, he felt the lion wasn't chasing him anymore. So as he looked back, he says, it's true, the lion wasn't chasing him. In, in, instead, the lion was seated in a prayer posture, you know. And he, was, he stopped and he looked at the lion in a prayer posture. He was curious. And he saw the lion's mouth moving also, you know, like praying like that. So he was curious. Uh, this guy is silly, isn't he? He, shouldn't, he, he? he better run away. He should have run away. But he, he wanted to hear what the lion is praying. So he went as close as possible to the lion. And he went so near to the lion that he heard the lion pray. Lord, thank you for the food for which I'm about to partake. <laughs> so, beloved, I want you to see down here, who is God to us? In times of trouble, oh, I'll call upon him. Other than that, I forget about it. Uh. Church, no time for it. Bible study, no time. Read the scriptures, no time. Uh, you know. But there is hope that God gives to us on the occasion of Christmas. Give the word to many. Don't treat him like a servant, isn't it? On the occasion of Christmas, I pray that all of you in uh, Moriah here will not only have a blessed Christmas, but you will also have a Christmas where you yourself will have hope in Jesus and you are definitely sure of your salvation in Christ and you will also seek to share the truth with others who don't have hope in our Saviour Jesus Christ. When he gave, when he came into this world to give us hope, the hope of salvation and eternal life. Let's look to God in prayer. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we are thankful for all you have done for us. By sending Jesus into this world, your blessed and wonderful son, to die on Calvary's cross for our sins. Thank you for the occasion of Christmas. What a wonderful Time for us to be reminded of that glorious hope, that wonderful hope which we see in the Old Testament when Israel went through lots of trouble. And in the New Testament, when Jesus came, when you came, dear Lord Jesus, and you gave hope to the people who live in darkness in the land of Zebulun and Natali, in Capernaum, in Chorazin, in Bethsaida, Galilee, the land of the Gentiles. And I pray, Father in heaven, we too will also give forth this glorious hope to many who don't understand the occasion of Christmas, but that they will be able to have this wonderful truth 
and once again be able to know the coming of our Saviour Jesus Christ, the meaning of Christmas. So Lord, bless the words in the hearts of all of us, seal it in the hearts of each one of us, and give us grace to bring forth fruits in our lives, that we will apply the lessons to the praise and glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.